Today we're going to talk about the Spanish-American War. Early in 1896, James Creelman traveled to Cuba as a New York World reporter covering the Second Cuban War for Independence from Spain. While in Havana, he wrote columns about his observations of the war. His descriptions of Spanish atrocities aroused American sympathies for the Cubans. No man's life, no man's property is safe in Cuba. American citizens are imprisoned or slain without cause. American property is destroyed on all sides. Wounded soldiers can be found begging in the streets of Havana. The horrors of a barbarous struggle for the extermination of the native population are witnessed in all parts of the country. Blood on the roadsides, blood in the fields, blood on the doorsteps, blood, blood, blood. Is there no nation wise enough, brave enough, to aid this blood-smitten land? Newspapers during the time period often exaggerated stories like Creelman's to boost their sales as well as, as well as provoke American intervention in Cuba. Here are some of the people you're going to run across. Um, Jose Marti, who you already know a little bit about. Teddy Roosevelt, who you know plenty about. A guy named Enrique de Lome and Valeriano Whaler, the butcher. We're gonna find out why the United States would get involved in Cuba today, what yellow journalism is, and why the explosion of one of our steel hulled cruisers, the USS Maine, was so significant. By the end of the 19th century, Spain, one of the most powerful colonial nations on earth, had lost most of its colonies. It retained only the Philippines and the island of Guam in the Pacific and a few outposts in Africa and the Caribbean islands of Cuba and Puerto Rico in the Americas. American interest in Cuba. The United States had long held an interest in Cuba. It lies only 90 miles off the south coast of Florida, and in 1854, diplomats recommended to President Franklin Pierce that the United States buy it from Spain. The Spanish responded by saying that they'd rather see Cuba sunk into the ocean than sell it to the United States. But American interest in Cuba continued, and when the Cubans yelled against Spain between 1868 and 1878, American sympathies went out for the Cuban people. The Cuban revolt against Spain was not successful. But in 1886, the Cuban people did force Spain to abolish slavery. After the emancipation of Cuba's slaves, American capitalists began investing millions of dollars in large sugarcane plantations on the island. This should sound familiar to you. About that time, there was a second war for independence, and this is where Jose Marti comes into the picture. Anti-Spanish sentiment in Cuba soon erupted into a second war for independence. Jose Marti, a Cuban poet and a journalist in exile in New York, launched a revolution in 1895. Marti organized Cuban resistance against Spain. He used active guerrilla campaign and deliberately destroyed property to rally American-owned sugar mills and plantations and their owners. He counted on provoking U.S. intervention to help the rebels achieve Cuba Libre, or to free the Cubans. Public opinion in the United States was split. There were a lot of business people who wanted the government to support Spain in order to protect their own investments. On the other hand, there were Americans that were enthusiastic about the rebel cause. The cry Cuba Libre, after all, seemed similar in sentiment to Patrick Henry's Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death. Before we leave Jose Marti behind, he was born in 1853, died in 1895. He was a Cuban political activist. He dedicated his life to achieving um, independence for Cuba. He was expelled from Cuba at the age of 16 because of his revolutionary activities. Marti earned a, ma earned a master's degree and a law degree, and he eventually settled in the United States. Wary of the U.S. role in Cuba's struggle against the Spanish, Marti warned, I know the monster because I have lived in its lair. His fears of U.S. imperialism turned out to have been well-founded. U.S. troops would occupy Cuba on and off from 1906 until 1922, and Marti would die fighting for Cuban independence in 1895. 
He's revered today in Cuba as a hero and a martyr. Headline Wars, I'm going to introduce you to two pretty important people in the United States history. William Randolph Hearst, who's on the right. You can still see Hearst Castle, um, I think just near, maybe just south of the San Francisco area today. And the gentleman on the left is Joseph Pulitzer, after which the Pulitzer Prize is named. Both of these guys were running competing newspapers during the time period. And unlike today, where journalism, you know, we view journalism as excellent if it is truth telling, during this time period, they didn't have the same sort of um, checks. And so yellow journalism, which is exaggerated, sensationalized journalism was um, typical of the day. And these two got into something called circulation wars and would try to outdo the other with regards to sensationalized journalism. And unfortunately, in some cases, uh, it had real negative consequences. Some people argue that yellow journalism was the reason the Spanish-American War happened. Let's see what you think. Here's a sugar plantation owner over here. You are a sad, strange little man. And Jose Marti over here. Oh, he's not saying what he wanted to say. Okay. War fever escalates. In 1896, Spain responded to the Cuban revolt by sending General Valeriano Whaler to Cuba to restore order. Valeriano Whaler tried to crush the rebellion by herding the entire rural population of Central and Western Cubans into barbed wire concentration camps. Here, civilians could not give aid to rebels, and an estimated 300,000 Cubans filled those camps where thousands would die from hunger and disease. <laughs> Headline Wars. Whaler's actions fueled a war over newspaper circulation that had developed between American newspaper tycoon William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. To lure readers, Hearst's New York Journal and Pulitzer's New York World printed really exaggerated accounts by reporters such as James Creelman, his reports on the butcher Whaler's brutality, stories of poisoned wells and children being thrown to the sharks deepened American sympathy for the rebels. This sensational style of writing, which exaggerates the news to lure and enrage readers, became known as yellow journalism. Feeding children to the sharks. Do not tell my son because now he's 23 years old, but that was him when he was about four. I used to make him make me sound effects. So Hearst and Pulitzer fanned war fever. When Hearst sent the gifted artist Frederick Remington to Cuba to draw sketches of the reporter's stories, Remington informed the publisher that a war between the United States and Spain seemed really unlikely. Hearst reportedly replied, you furnish the pictures and I will furnish the war. Now that ought to sell some papers. The DeLome Letter. American sympathy for a Cuba Libre grew with each day's headlines, and when President William McKinley took office in 1897, demands for American intervention in Cuba were on the rise. Preferring to avoid war with Spain, McKinley tried diplomatic means to resolve the crisis, and at first his efforts appeared to succeed. Spain recalled General Whaler, modified the policy regarding concentration camps, and offered Cuba a limited self-government. In February of 1898, however, the New York Journal published a private letter between Enrique de Lome, the Spanish minister to the United States. A Cuban rebel had stolen the letter from a Havana post office and leaked it to the newspaper which was thirsty for scandal. The DeLone letter criticized President McKinley, calling him weak and a bitter for the admiration of the crowd. The embarrassed Spanish government apologized, and the minister resigned. 
but still Americans were angry over the insult to their president. Which leads us to this fuzzy picture, which is the USS Maine exploding. <clears throat> Only a few days after the publication of the Delome letter, American resentment towards Spain turned to absolute outrage. Early in 1898, President McKinley had ordered the USS Maine to Cuba to bring home American citizens who might be in danger from the fighting and to protect American property. On February 15th of 1898, the ship blew up in the harbor of Havana. More than 260 men were killed. At the time, no one really knew why the ship exploded. In 1898, however, the American newspapers claimed the Spanish had blown up the ship. The journal's headlines, one of them at least, read, the warship Maine was split in two by an enemy's secret infernal machine. Spanish treachery. Hearst paper offered a reward of $50,000 for the capture of the Spaniards who'd committed the atrocity. Let me show you one more. Okay, so just FYI, um, in later years there was actually work done to try to figure out why the main had exploded and years later they discovered it was internal combustion like engine failure there was no you know spanish treachery at all it was an internal issue with the ship but nonetheless the spanish were blamed and it brought the united states into a war with with the spanish over cuba Almost done. Now there was no holding back the forces that wanted war. Remember the Maine became the rallying cry for U.S. intervention in Cuba. It made no difference that the Spanish government agreed on April 9th to almost everything the United States demanded, including a six-month ceasefire. Teddy Roosevelt, rising in the political ranks, was anxious for war himself and for the adventure. He's going to resign his political post, and he's going to volunteer to go to Cuba and fight as one of the Rough Riders. Despite the Spanish concessions, public opinion favored war. On April 11th, McKinley asked Congress for the authority to use force against Spain, and after a week of debate, Congress agreed. On April 20th, the United States declared war. I'm going to hold up right here and show you just an intro to Teddy Roosevelt's feelings about this whole thing. A century has passed since Washington wrote, to be prepared for war is the most effectual means of promoting the peace. In 1897, as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, T.R. finds a cause that can help him redeem his family's honor. In Cuba, a long-simmering insurgency against the Spanish colonial empire is coming to a head. TR clamors for military intervention there, arguing that it's America's duty to liberate its oppressed neighbors. It was Theodore Roosevelt that was the first one to say, we have a responsibility to go over and bring people freedom, our freedom, and mess in their affairs. And quite honestly, that's the trouble that we have now in the Middle East. That's the trouble that we have everywhere in the world is that we were saying, we're so great, we're going to bring this to you. That was an invention of Theodore Roosevelt. The loss of national honor. What Teddy needs is a persuasive cause for attacking Cuba, a weapons of mass destruction argument, and he's about to get one. Remember the main? Probably not. Most Americans don't. But that's the U.S. warship that exploded in Havana Harbor in February 1898 taking 254 American sailors to their watery graves. Like 9-11 a century later, the tragedy roused America into vengeful fury and gave Teddy the cause for war he so desperately sought, even though it wasn't clear who was to blame. Created tremendous war fever in the country and outrage on the part of T.R. who thought this hideous act against us was uh, needed to be dealt with immediately.